Hey everybody, and welcome back to Ready Steady Play. I'm Mike, and I've got for you today the Taverns of Tiefendel, which is the new game from Wolfgang Varsh, the designer of Quacks of Quedlinburg. This is a light to middleweight Euro game for two to four players that takes roughly an hour to play, depending on what level of difficulty you're playing it at and your player count. <laughs> It's a deck building, dice drafting, action selection game. Each player has a tavern board, and what we're going to be doing every round is playing servers and guests to our tavern, filling it with people, and then we will be drafting dice to take actions based on who's shown up. You might uh, find guests in your tavern, you might find staff serving the guests. Ultimately, you're trying to build up the most profitable tavern, producing the best beer, in order to attract these nobles who are worth the most points. The game has five different levels to it. At level one, you'll be playing with what you see here, and this is the most basic version of the game. You can increase the level through different modules, all the way up to five. And at module five, you'll be playing with everything in the box. It's not possible to play five without including everything else. So you're not adding the modules you like, but rather just escalating difficulty until you include everything. Each level adds a sort of extra layer of complexity to the game, so you're slowly building up more levels of complexity. But even at level 5, I don't think it's too much. It's not a heavy euro. It's middleweight at its most complex. So, as you've come to expect from my rules and setup videos, I'll first do a component rundown where we'll look at the components in the box, and then I will do a setup video and we'll talk about setting up module 1. We won't cover anything from modules 2, 3, 4, and 5 in the setup. So what we'll do in the gameplay section is we'll focus on module 1, which contains all the fundamentals of play. Once we've done that, we'll cover all of the elements included in setting up and playing module 2, 3, 4, and 5 at the end, so that you can look at those if you want to remember how to implement them. So without any further delay, let's take a look at the components in the box. A lot of the setup will involve setting up the player's board, which consists of everything I've put in this player bag, and I'll go through that in just a minute. And all of this will fit into your tavern, which looks like this. You'll also need one of these. One safe, one brewer's cart, one house brew barrel, one monk, one cash chest, one bartender, a little tracker here for the bartender's bar, I'm just going to slot that in there, fit that side up for now. You'll need three dice in your color. Note that the player colors are depicted here in the name of their bar. And here's the blue bar. We've got currently a bunch of pans that need washing with a dishwasher side. We've got a helpful dog with a bar wench on the back. Here we've got a small cellar and a large cellar for storing beer. We've got a disc here for the monastery track in your color. You've got a money and beer token here four white dice, and seven cards called your regulars, and their tablecloths should also match your player color. And a beer mat, of course. These are double-sided with a stained side and a clear side, but it doesn't matter which side you decide to use. Now this is everything that you will need for one player to begin the game, and it should be noted that the reason I bagged it up this way is that you won't need any of these components if you're not playing with a red player. In addition to the player boards, you've also got this monastery board, and you'll need this whenever you play the game, and it even has these chips at the top that have symbols on the reverse. So this is called the winter side, and I'll explain what that means later. We've also got these people here. These are the patrons, and there should be three per player. We've got this stein of beer, which is the first player marker, and we've got this moon, which is the turn tracker. We've got a big old deck of nobles, and these are all the same. There's two different artworks but the nobles all count as the same. Then we've got this deck of guests, and these are the guests that cost between four and eight beers. Then we've got this smaller deck of patrons, which is distinct from the other deck because all of these patrons cost three beers. Of course, we're referring to this symbol on the top of the card. We've got a deck of barbacks, a deck of dishwashers, a deck of bar wenches, a deck of tables, and a deck of brewers. And that's all the stuff you need to play module one. But now I'm going to run you through the components for modules 2, 3, 4, and 5. For module 2, you'll need these entertainers. There are three different kinds. Fan, tambourine dancer, the fire breather, and the jester juggler. You'll also need these 
wonderful schnapps tokens. And you'll need these three tokens we looked at from the monastery board on their schnapps side. For module three, we're going to introduce this reputation track on the back side of the bartender. You'll have a little reputation cube, which we'll use to move around the track. You've got a bard here who's going to be added to the pool of characters. And I've also got some new guests here, which will be shuffled into the deck of guests. And they're noted they're distinct from the other guests by this little white cube at the top. So that's what notes they're part of module three. Module four is this blue deck of cards here, and this changes the starting setup of your tavern. For module five, we'll finally flip over this little pit at the bottom of the bartender here. So we've got a complete track around the outside. We're going to need this guest book here. We're going to need all these guests signature tokens as well. And that's module five. So those are all the components in the box. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through setup. So what we're going to do here is set up module one of the game. So we're going to start by setting up the monastery board, then we'll set up the guest marketplace, finally we'll set up the player's taverns. And I'm going to set up a two-player game, because that should be enough to give you an indication of how the game works, and allow me to demonstrate it later. But the setup for two, three, and four players is identical, except you add more components. Setting up the monastery board is very, very simple. Just put it down like this, and make sure you put it on its daytime side not the winter side. This is used with the more complex modules. Take these little tokens here and just slot them into the top. The order doesn't matter because they're just going face down anyway. Next take three counter patrons per player and just place them below the board. Note that their facing doesn't matter, they're double-sided. Players can choose which side they want to play with when they spend the token, which we'll explain in gameplay. We're setting up a two-player game, so we'll play with six. Finally, just take the round marker and put it next to the round track here, ready to be used during the game. We're just going to take out our servers here and put them in their separate piles. These are forming a marketplace, so we don't need to shuffle them, and they can just all be face up. Next, take your three cost guests. They all look the same, like this, with the three cost beers in the top and the three for three symbols down the bottom here. And they're worth one point there. so. Just put them out here. Next, we'll take the big old deck of nobles and just put that on the right. Note that because they're all the same, the order doesn't matter, just like with our servers down here. Next up, we're going to take our remaining guests, and they're the ones with a cost that's not three. And make sure that they don't have any white cubes at the top. Those are for use for the later module. I'm just going to give this deck a good shuffle. And we put this deck down to the left of the three cost guests. And then we reveal guests from the top of the deck, four guests, so that we have a marketplace of five. If at any point all of these were to sell out, we would reveal a fifth guest from the top of this deck. But it's unlikely that all the three cost guests will sell out. And so you've populated the row from the deck of guests here. And finally, we'll set up a player's tavern. So here we're setting up the red player's tavern, as noted up here. By the red flag there. What we're going to do is be taking these puzzle pieces and slotting them onto the board. And you'll note that some of them have a cost and some don't. So we're just going to make sure that we put up the sides with the cost at the top onto the board. So this is the dishwasher and it fits in here on this side. We're going to take the bartender and put them in the middle here. Note that they've got this little slotted piece down here with this signature on the back. Don't worry about that. That's for use of the module. So just put it face down. Here we've got the barrel of house brew, and we can see the cost at the top here, so we put it that side up, next to the bartender. Here we've got the safe for the earnings in the bar, with an upgraded reverse, so make sure you put the cost facing up. We've got our loyal pooch here, who's going to go on the right, left here. Here's our beer seller delivering goods, and here's our beer seller here. Finally we've got the seats where our patrons will sit, they go along the top here. And here's a patron to start in the bar. This is a monk, and he's going to go in this spot here. Again, you can see the cost at the top here, that side showing up. And here we've got a cash chest. So we're going to put that in the final available spot. Next, we'll take this little money cube here and put it on the safe. We'll take this little beer cube and put it down here, and the beer cellar on the zero space. 
So every player puts together their tavern deck, which looks like this on the back, and it's going to start with these seven regulars. You've got three ones and four twos, and to this deck you're going to add one server, one table, and one brewer for a total of ten cards. Then just give that a shuffle. What you're going to do is you're going to put it down on the top of your tavern just here. Take your three colored player die and put them above your tavern. You don't need them yet, but you will need them later. Take your coaster, put your four white die on the coaster, and put it somewhere convenient. Finally, take your player disc and put it here in the center of the monastery track. And so here you can see I've got a two player game all set up and ready to go. The game is of course the golden lion against the green clover. And the last thing you're going to do once you've done all of that and you're ready to start the game is decide the first player. The game says that the last player to go into a tavern will be the first player, but you can decide by any means you like, and you give that player the first player marker, which is the Stein of Beer. Now the game is all set up, and you're ready to play. So we're all set up for a two-player game, and now we're going to talk about gameplay. This is for Module 1, the most basic version of the game, but we'll talk about Modules 2 through 5 at the end of this gameplay section, when we'll cover everything in Module 1. There are eight rounds in a game, and the rounds are marked along the top of the monastery track here, with the moon moving on until it reaches round eight, and at the end of the round eight, the game will end, and the player with the most victory points is declared the winner. Each round is divided up into a number of phases. There are seven phases per round. Some of them are simultaneous play, and others are turn order. And it's really very simple, but of course it will escalate because there's a deck building element to the game. So each round represents a day in the life of the tavern, I suppose. So we're going to see who can make the most money and attract the most nobles in eight days. We're going to be making money, which we're going to use to hire new staff, and we're going to be brewing beer, which we're going to use to attract guests. Both staff and guests are worth points at the end of the game, but guests are worth a lot more. Nobles from the big deck here are worth the most points, but they're also the hardest to attract because they have such high standards. The victory points on each card are indicated in the shield in the top right corner of the card. The cost is in beer in the top left, or on a staff member it's in thalos, which is the money in the top left. Nobles don't have a cost, but they're also purchased with beer. You can see here a track on the monastery board that tells you how much beer costs for nobles. This crown, which you can see here on the noble card, refers to a single noble card. So you can have one card for nine beers, two cards for 14 beers, and three cards for 18 beers. But we'll talk more about how you brew beer and get to nobles in later phases of the game. In the very first phase of the game, called A New Evening in the Tavern, the starting player takes the round marker and moves it on one space. When you move the round marker, each player, you immediately gain the bonus depicted beneath the round number. In this case, each player would gain one counter patron. All of these icons are depicted in the back of the rule book. The most common notation looks like this, which is the pale white card covered with this action symbol. The pale white cards always refer to the servers and the action symbol on the server cards. So whenever you see that, you know you're going to get one of these cards to add to your deck. In this case, each player has collected one of the counter patrons from the monastery board. and will add them to their bar board here like this. These tokens can be spent at a later time for the effect on either side, and you don't have to decide which effect you want to use until you spend the token. Now that we've resolved the first part phase, a new evening in the tavern, it's time for part two, the guests arrive. Now this section of the game is played out automatically and simultaneously. Each player will take their deck of cards and start revealing the cards onto their player board. So we'll take our bar deck here and we'll start revealing cards. So our first card is the Serving Wench, and she goes down here to the left of our dog. Our next card is a Regular, and they are sitting down here at the seats where the guests sit. Next up we've got a table, and that goes next to the other tables here. Next we've got another Regular, and they go down here. Next we've got a Brewer, who goes down here next to the Brewer's entrance. And then another Regular, and another Regular. Once all the tables are full of regulars, you stop drawing cards and put your remaining cards face down here. Of course, once you get more servers, you may find filling up more spaces. 
if you were to draw a dishwasher from the top of your deck, they would go down here. And if it were a bar back, they would go down here. There are no limits to the number of servers and staff members you can put alongside your player board. So our yellow player has finished the guests arrive round. Our green player has finished it too, but is not so lucky. They've only managed to get their brewer before all their seats filled up. Because our green player didn't get a very good draw this round, they may decide to spend their counter patron. You must use your counter patron at the end of the guests arrive phase if you don't like what you've drawn. You take the token and you return it to the space below the monastery board. And then you take all of your face up cards, put them into a discard pile, and start dealing again from the top of your deck. So, in this case, our green player would take all of these cards, and now they would start again from the top of this deck. And so now the tables are all full again, and this is their new, and this will be their setup for the round. They could go again if they had more captor patrons to spend, but they don't. If they did, then they would simply move all of these cards into this discard pile, shuffle it, and start again from the top. And that completes the guests arrive phase. The next phase is called here comes the server. And in this phase, you just look at how many server cards you have and roll that many of your player colored dice. Our yellow player has one server, so they'll roll one yellow die and put it below their player board here. Because you only have three, you can only ever roll a maximum of three dice in this fashion, no matter how many servers you have next to your player board. Whenever you see this symbol here, you know that means to roll one of your player die and place it beneath your tavern here. And the here comes the server phase can be done simultaneously because each player is just rolling a number of their own dice and keeping them for themselves. Next we have the can I take your order phase. And in this phase we're going to be rolling these white dice. Now each player can roll the white dice simultaneously. And once they've done that, they're just going to take their dice and put them on their beer mat. Once this has been done, starting with the first player, they're going to select one of the dice and put it beneath their tavern board. Then you'll go around the table in clockwise order, with each player selecting a die and putting it beneath their tavern mat. Then the beer coasters travel around the table in clockwise order, which just means in this case swapping because it's a two-player game. And starting with the first player, you draft again. And continue swapping until this has happened four times, and each player has four white dice. And that's the can I take your order phase. Next we're going to do the plan your actions phase, and this can be done simultaneously, and it is a bit more of a flexible phase. You're not actually locked into the actions you select in this phase at all, but this is really kind of a helpful reminder about what you plan to do over the next phase, which is the serve your guests phase, in which we'll be doing a lot of actions and carrying out the upgrades to our deck and all kinds of fun stuff. So let's have a look at our tavern and see what we can do with our dice. And what we were looking for are symbols like this one on the bottom of the cash register. Any space like this means you can put a dice down, and the green arrow means you'll get something to the right of it. Now you'll notice that uh, some of these green arrows have little times ones in them, while others have ellipses. The times one means one die, and the ellipses mean as many dice as you like. But it should be noted that the question mark can be any die, so it doesn't matter what number the die is showing, whereas if it shows a five, or any other number, it needs to be exactly that number. So you can only put a five down on the monk. The brewer shows one or six, and because we've got the ellipses, that means you can put down any number of dice, which means you can put down any combination of ones and sixes on this tile. The two tiles with the wooden cubes on don't actually have a die space because these are storage. This is your money storage, and this is your beer storage. These are the two currencies in the game, and we'll talk about how they're used in the next phase, serve the guests. But for now, we're going to need some beer and we're going to need some money. So let's go ahead and put a six down here on the brewer. We'll put a one and another one on the brewer. That's going to give us lots of beer to spend later. Then we've got these twos. So why don't we put one down here on this patron here? And you can see we're lucky enough to have two of these. So we'll stick the other one down here on this patron. I'll be covering what all these actions do in a minute in the next phase description, but for now, that's how you place dice out on your tavern board. So now that all players have simultaneously completed the plan your actions phase, and you can see all their dice are out on their boards, we're ready to move on to the serve your guests phase, which occurs in turn order. So we'll start with the yellow player. 
So in this phase, what we're going to be doing is removing dice from our board in order to take the actions on the board. And primarily what we're going to be accruing are beers, which, you know, look like this, and Thalos, which look like this. These are the two currencies in the game we're going to be using to do different actions, and based on which currency we have, we'll determine which actions we can do. They're virtual currencies, which means they're not represented by in-game tokens, so you just kind of have to remember what amount you have. The order in which you remove the dice from your tavern here and activate the actions is quite important because you can do different things and unlock different things as you go. So you're really going to learn how, have to learn how to think about these. But in module one, at this basic level, it's pretty straightforward. So in this case, we're going to remove two dice here and put them back on our mat. And that gives us four coins to spend. Now, there are two things you can do with Thalons. The first is upgrade your tavern. All of these little tiles that we set out earlier have this cost at the top, which means they can be upgraded. When you upgrade the tile, you pay the cost, which is 12 here, so we can't afford this. But when you pay the cost, you flip the tile over and put it back down. Now it's an upgraded tile. You see this little symbol here that says upgraded tile and gain a noble. So whenever you do this, you gain a noble to put face down on top of your deck. So you can see that when we pay the 12 thalons to upgrade the dog, we get an extra bar wench, and she will be on our player board, which means we'll have her every round, so we don't have to wait to draw her to unlock one of our player dice. Helpfully, the little bar wench symbol is up here to remind you that that's what this tile becomes when you upgrade it. This little negative four means that for every bar wench we have here, we can return them from our player board to the supply to reduce the cost. So we take this one, we put her back in the supply here, and then we only have to pay eight thalons to upgrade this tile instead of four. We can sacrifice as many bar wenches as we want when we upgrade the tile, and we'll get a negative four discount for each one. However, once we've gone to negative 12 and the cost is reduced to zero, the fourth bar wench we sacrifice doesn't gain us any additional discount, so we might want to hang on to her. And then we could upgrade the tile for free. If we had a die down here on the house brew, and we paid nine Thalos to upgrade it, we'd take the die off, we'd flip the die over, and now it's worth two beers. Then we'd put the die back. So if we upgrade it while there's a die on it, it becomes worth two beers during this step. This is true of any that you upgrade. So it's worth remembering that as you progress. Where it's particularly valuable is here on the house beer step, here on the monk who can be upgraded to a bishop, and we'll talk about what they do in a minute, or here on the cash register, which will get you three thalos instead of one. You can upgrade the table board, as you can see here, and you can discount it by cashing in tables. If you want to cash in a table, you just take the guest off, return the table to the common supply, and then return the guest there. Then you pay the 10 talons, that's 15 minus five for the table you returned. You can return any number of tables, reducing it the cost to a minimum of zero, flip over the board, and now you'll have an extra table moving forward. We've returned our existing guests, but we don't populate this table until the next guest's arriving phase. It should be noted that the bartender doesn't have a cost because he can't be upgraded. What we can afford to do is buy a server. So we decide to buy a bar wench, and she's added face down on top of our draw deck, so we know we're going to see her next turn. It's really important to note that whenever you gain a card, whether it's Noble, a Guest, or a Server, it always goes face down on top of your deck. So we looked at the Server during the Here Comes the Server step, and how she unlocks your player dice. We also saw during the Guests Arrive step how the table works, increasing your capacity for more guests. We'll look at the Brewer in just a minute when we talk about how to spend beer. The bar back just gives you one additional beer. So we'll talk about him when we talk about how to spend beer in a minute. And so our final server is the dishwasher. When you're purchasing servers, you can only purchase one server per type. So up to five servers if they're all different. Now the dishwashers, of course, live here next to the sink. And if you draw a dishwasher here, when the guests arrive, then when you're placing your dice in the place dice step, you could treat one die as though it was exactly one number higher than its current number. So we could treat this two as a three for the purposes of planning it. It should also be noted that when they're adjusting a die, you can apply all three dishwashers to the same die face. So if we had three, we could treat this two as a three, four, or five. 
Now let's say we treat this two as a five and put it here on the monk. When you're planning the die, don't change its face so you can remember that you've adjusted it three times with all three of your dishwashers. You can, of course, have any number of dishwashers, and they can be sacrificed just like the server to reduce the cost of upgrading the tile, which is indicated by the little discount symbol here. And for each one you get rid of, you get a discount of minus three. So putting three back to the pool will allow you to upgrade it for free. And of course, as with any other tile, when you upgrade it, you get a free noble. It'll then count as having a dishwasher every round for the rest of the game. Now we've got three dice here on the brewer's space, which we can spend on beer. Whenever you see the symbol, you get to have a beer. So any barbacks we revealed during the guests arrive step would be here next to the beer cellar. They would add one beer to our total. If we had any dice down here on the house brew, they would add one beer to our total. And then for every die you put down here on the brewer's entrance step, you get one beer per dice on this phase, plus one per dice per card here. What that means is in this case, we've got three dice, and two brewers, so we get six beers. If we had two brewers here, then we would have nine beers. Three dice and three brewers. Just like any of the other tiles here, the brewer can be upgraded and discounted by returning brewer cards to the communal pool. And when you do that, you get to flip it over. So every die here is worth two beers, and of course you get a free noble. So this round, our yellow player has managed to accrue a total of six beers. So we'll take these two dice here back to the coaster, and this one back to the top of our board. You can only buy one guest each round, not including nobles, so our yellow player can purchase any of the guests here, up to the cost of six beers. They decide to purchase this one, and you'll notice that some guests have a symbol in the middle, some don't. That symbol in the middle is an immediate effect that happens upon purchase of the guest. So in this case, this guest will give us whatever this symbol means, and we remember that the white cards refer to the servers, and that this plus beer is in fact a brewer. So we'll take a brewer card, and our guest and add them to our deck. And now we'll immediately replace that with a new guest. Our green player has got a grand total of four coins. However, they really just want a dishwasher, so they're gonna take one of these and put them face down on top of their deck. But they only cost three, so the remaining coin will be stored here in their safe and can be used later on. Note that you can only store a maximum of two coins in the safe unless you upgrade it. Our green player's also got a beer here, but can't buy anything for one beer, so they're just gonna put it into their beer cellar for use in the later round. Now both our players have run out of dice, and this signals the end of the serve your guests phase. However, before I go, I will explain the monk and the monastery track, because that's also activated in this phase. So if you've got a die down on the monk, you've got this little symbol here, which looks like a little gray symbol and has a one on it. If you've upgraded to the second side, it's got a two. This is the monastery track, and when you remove a die from a monk, you get to advance your token one space on the monastery track. Or if you've got the upgraded side, two spaces. Whenever you land on or pass a number with a symbol below it, you get what that indicates. So in this case, you'd get a bartender. Up here, this means you get to remove a guest from your tavern. And that guest can be a regular or a guest that you've purchased. In this case, our yellow player can only remove one guest, this gentleman here. This gentleman is returned to the game box and out of play. You cannot remove guests with dice on them. However, because the serve your guests phase doesn't really have a strict order to it, you can remove a die from one of your guests, claim the two coins, and then return them to the game box using the effect you've just unlocked. Down here, you get to have a dishwasher and add them to your deck. When you get to this space here, you get to have a noble and add them to your deck. When you get up here, you're going to get a bar wench. Here you'll get a brewer. Here you're going to get a table. Here, another noble. When you get to here, you'll add two thalons to your current pool. Around here it's three. And when you get to the final space, you get another noble. Now, if you do advance your track again, you'll just jump back over to the one and start going around all over again. If you happen to have any counter patrons at your bar and you don't want to use them for the reset side, you can always flip them over and cast them in to advance one on the monastery track. So now that we've done all of that, we're ready for the final phase, closing time. Closing time is very simple. Each player takes all of their face-up cards and puts them into the discard. This card just exists next to your deck here. And the very last thing, the starting player shifts to the left. But in this case, we're going all the way around the table to the other player. And then that player begins the next round 
Now, when it comes to the end of the game, that is to say, the starting player goes to move on the round marker, but it's already above the eight, then that's the end of the game, and it's time to count up victory points. And in this instance, you will count up the victory points on the top right corner of all of the servers, guests, and nobles in your bar. That's the only way to gain victory points in Module 1. And whoever has the most is the winner. In the case of a tie, whoever has the most beer and gold in their stores, cumulatively, is the tiebreaker. There are just a few easy-to-forget rules, but the most important is that you get a noble whenever you upgrade a tile on your board. And also don't forget that all the cards you gain go on top of your deck. It can be a little unusual. You do not reset and shuffle your deck until you're required to draw cards and it's empty. And of course, don't forget that you can only buy one guest each round, not including nobles. And you can only buy one of each type of server each round as well. And so with that, you know everything you need to play Module 1, and we're ready to talk about Module 2. So for setup for Module 2, the first thing we're going to do is flip over the Monastery board to its winter side. Then we're going to take these little tokens here and put them into the slots at the top of the board with a 2, then a 1, and then a 2. So you'll notice a few differences here. We've got these schnapps shots in between the rounds. We've got some new interesting characters along the bottom here. And we've got some schnapps around the monastery track as well. Now we'll take these schnapps tokens here and make a communal pool. Finally, we're going to take the entertainers and put out one of each type per player. Just below the monastery board there. So the way this module works is fairly straightforward. What we're going to do is we're going to advance the round marker as usual. And whenever we pass a schnapps, we're going to give a schnapps to a player to put down here on the counter of their bar. When we land on a round situation with one of the entertainers, we take the appropriate tiles and give one to each player. Each player must then decide which side they want face up and put that side into their tavern. Each entertainer has two sides, and these unlock abilities for you to use. All of the abilities on the entertainers are purchased with schnapps. And as you can see, similar to our notations on the actions, some of them allow you to do the actions multiple times, while others allow you to do them just once. So our first entertainer here is the Fan Dancer, and she allows you to spend a schnapps in the serve the guests phase to add two coins to your pool. And this can be done any number of times. On her reverse, it's two schnapps for three beers. When we advance to round three, you'll get two more schnapps and you'll unlock the fire breather. The fire breather lets you spend two schnapps to remove a guest from your tavern. This follows the exact same rules as the space on the monastery board we looked at earlier. Any guest who's currently visiting your tavern and does not have a die on them can be removed back to the game box from the game. On the reverse of the fire breather, you can spend five schnapps to upgrade any tile on your board. So this is in place of spending the money, and it should be noted that when you do this, you get a free noble. Our final guest here is the juggler, and you can spend one schnapps, and so this ability would be used during closing time. And when you're picking up your cards and putting them face up into your discard pile, you can choose one card to put face down on top of your deck instead. Note that this can only be done once per closing time phase and costs a schnapps. The reverse of the juggler is used during the plan your actions phase and you can spend a schnapps to make one die wild. That means turning it to any die face. And note that you must do this during the planning phase before you put the dice into the action spaces on your board. But you can do it any number of times as long as you have the schnapps to pay. And each player can choose which side they want the entertainers to be on, but once you've committed to a side, that's you for the rest of the game. Of course, as you progress around the monastery tech, whenever you land on a space with a schnapps, just gain a schnapps to your bar counter. Any schnapps on your bar counter that you haven't spent at the end of the game are worth one victory point. And so that's module two. So now we're looking at module three, the reputation track. So for module three, the main thing you're going to need to do is flip over your bartender, but not this little tab. And this, around the bar, is the reputation track. You're also going to need these bards. You're going to need these new guests, distinct from the other guests by this white cube at the top. And you're going to need this white cube. There are two important things you're going to do during setup. 
We're going to take our bartender here. And we're going to put our white cube on the bartender during setup. And because we're going to be playing with module two, the schnapps module, we're actually going to flip these back over to their blank side, but we're keeping this board on the winter side. It should be noted that the only time these are used face up is in module two. Then we're going to take these extra guests and just shuffle them into our guest deck here. And so as this is a part of setup, hopefully we'll get to see some of these new guests come out during the forming of the marketplace. Shuffle that during the appropriate setup step, and as normal, reveal four from the top of the deck. And we've also got these bards, which we'll just put into our server marketplace here, because they can be purchased like any other server. So essentially what we're doing here is we're adding in this reputation track. So one of the most important things to rep remember about module three, the reputation module, is the reputations phase. The reputations phase is added after the planning phase before the serve your guests phase. So once you've placed all your dice, but before removing any of them from your cards. In order to calculate the reputations phase, first you work out how much money you'll get from all of the dice you've placed on the Thalers. In this case, we're gonna get three, four, five, six. So that's six. Then we'll work out how many beers we're gonna get from the placement of our dice down here. And we get four beers because we have two dice and two beers plus one for the bartender. If we put a dice down here, we would also get one for the house brew, but we didn't. We then calculate the lesser of these two volumes so in this case, we've got six, and in this case, we've got five. So we're going to advance our reputation marker five bases around the track. One, two, three, four, five. Every time you land on or pass one of these spaces, you'll get the reward on the space, and we'll talk about what those do in a minute. Over the course of the game, you might see this symbol come out, particularly if you buy the bards and put them into your deck. When you reveal a bard during the arrival of the guest step, you put it down here, with the bar backs, so they can exist together in the beer cellar. When you activate them during the serve the guest step, simply move the cube one space along the track because of the one here. You can move one space per bard that's come out in this way. And as you move around the track, you'll be given different rewards. At the end of the game, if you're on one of the spaces with victory points, you get that many victory points. When you reach or pass a space with a reward on it, you gain that reward. So in this case, we'd get a schnapps on the bar counter. When we get to here, we can choose a schnapps, or we can choose to get rid of a guest from one of the tables. And that, of course, can be one of our regulars, or one of the guests we've purchased previously that we don't want anymore. When you get around to here, you get to take a noble and put it on top of your deck. If you get around the whole thing, you can cross over and start over again, and continue to gain reputation points. At the end of the game, if you're on this space, or this space, you also gain the victory points preceding the space. So from here I'd get two, and from here I'd get six. Note that if I've got the noble space here, I don't get eight victory points because I've just collected the 10 for the noble. So starting over again, I can start gaining victory points again. Now that we've got new guests in the deck, some of them give us bonuses. Like this one, for example, immediately gives us a bard. Here's a guest that immediately gives us a schnapps, and here's a guest that immediately advances you three spaces on the reputation track. And so that's it for module three. Let's have a look at module four. So module four is the different starting setups. So obviously in order to play module four, we have module two and three installed already. Now module four is the different starting setup. So this will make just a few changes to the way we set up the game. So what we're going to do is use these cards to randomize setup a bit. So the only difference to set up here really is normally you would take your seven regulars here and you would add server, table, and brewer, but instead put those away. What we're going to do instead is we're going to deal out three of these at random and these are going to give you three different starting setups to choose from. Now each player picks one and that's going to be their starting setup, but you can pick the same ones if you want so you're not going to take these away. It's just each player has to choose one starting setup. In this one, you'll start with a brewer, a bard, a dishwasher, and a bartender. So you just take those cards and add them to your starting deck. And you're good to go. 
If our green player decided to pick this one, it would be a bit different. They wouldn't add any cards to their starting deck. Instead, they'd take out two regulars, and then advance their disc three spaces along the monastery track. Now this actually unlocks a bartender, so they'll add a bartender to your, their deck. Once each player has assigned their unique starting setup, they give their deck a shuffle, and then put them into the normal starting positions next to their tavern. In this random setup, you get a dishwasher, you get to get rid of a regular, and you get to upgrade your cash box for free. Note that you don't get a noble for performing this upgrade. In this case, you get a upgraded server, so you'll start with the server instead of the dog. No nobles, though, for that. And then you'll gain an additional server as well. In this one, you get to upgrade your beer storage facility. No nobles, though. And then you get an additional bard and an additional table. In this one, you get to upgrade your seating area, and you get an additional schnapps. This is the standard setup. You get a server, a brewer, and a table. And that's module four, the randomized startup. And with that, we come to the final module, Module 5. And with that, we come to the final module, Module 5, the Guest Book. For this phase, you'll need all of these guest signatures, create a common pool, and each player will need one of these guest books, which are identical. You just take the guest book and put it here at the top of your player board. For setup, we're also going to take one of these little signature tokens here, and put them on each guest face up in the guest marketplace. The last thing to do for setup is flip over this little token here. And we add a signature to this reputation track. The reputation continues to work the same as normal with the reputation phase moving the token around the track. So there's a new space. So now it's 12 spaces instead of 11. So the guest book is our way of showing off all the fancy people that have come to visit our tavern. And we're going to collect the signatures and put them here into our guest book. Whenever you buy a guest, as per the usual means, you'll put them face down on top of your deck, you'll get the immediate bonus here, but you'll also get this signature. If you purchased a guest, the guest is replaced from the top of the deck as normal, and a new signature is immediately added to them. The signature goes into the guest book matching the beer cost of the guest that you've just bought. So in this case, where signature is going here, into the column of five. As you can see on the guest book, there are four different columns, each masking the cost. So there's a 3-4 column, a 5 column, a 6 column, and a 7-8 column. You must fill the columns from the top down to the bottom. And when you cover up a space, you gain the reward on the space. So in this case, 3 reputation. In this case, a table. In this case, a noble. Obviously, this is the most expensive column and worth the most. If you complete a row, you get a noble as well for each row completed. However, whenever you pass the signature on the reputation track, you can take a signature from the common pool, and you can add it to any column in your book that you choose. And you'll immediately gain the reward. So of course you should be familiar with all this iconography by now. This one gains you a bar back. This one advances your reputation one. This one gains you a dishwasher. Here we've got a schnapps, and there we've got a server. This is three on the reputation track, then you get a table. And so with that we've actually covered every module in the Taverns of Tiefenthal. So I hope this video has been helpful in helping you get your game to the table, and I hope that you'll come back tomorrow to join me and Michael as we buy to create the best tavern in Tiefenthal. Thanks for watching, everyone, and I'll see you tomorrow.